I just remember being, I remember being at the content stores with you and telling you, I was like telling you how to change your brake pads. <laughs> I probably needed that information at that point. Hello and welcome to Ride Buddies where we step aside and bring you conversations between some of cycling's most interesting, knowledgeable, and entertaining personalities. All right, so here we are, episode one. We're starting things off with a bang and bringing you a conversation between two of our favorite cyclists, Jenny Graham and James Hayden. Jenny is an absolute powerhouse in the world of cycling. In addition to holding the Guinness World Record as the fastest female to cycle unsupported around the world, a wee spin of 18,000 miles. Jenny is also one of the key members of the Adventure Syndicate, which is definitely worth checking out. She's an accomplished rider and all around adventurer whose self-proclaimed dirtbag approach is an inspiration to people all over the world. She's great, and we really think that you'll connect with her. As for James, don't let his casual vibe fool you. He is a finely tuned British race machine. You might recognize his name from one of his multiple transcontinental race victories, or his second place at the Atlas Mountain Race, or maybe from his recent third place finish at this year's Highland Trail 550. The list goes on and on. But let's just say that James is a bit of an ultra endurance legend who also happens to be incredibly down to earth and really fun to chat with. Okay, this episode. These two cover a lot of ground. They swap stories of epic rides. They talk about their different approaches to doing what is ultimately the same thing, i.e. going really fast on really, really long bike rides. They crack jokes, they laugh, and they also reflect on life lessons they've learned along the way. So saddle up and tune in because you're in for a great ride with these two. Okay, so first one, first one, off-road or on-road? Oh, both. No, it has to be one. Why? Why did you do it? Because it's meant to be a difficult question. <laughs> um, if I could only ever choose one for the rest of my life, it would be off road. Yeah, good answer. Good answer. Uh, would you ever race in a pair? <sighs> Ooh. It. It would be testing, but yes. <laughs> More testing than the race. Person, yeah. <laughs> if you couldn't cycle, what would your activity be? Ooh, um, hill running. I'd love to be better Ooh. at hill running, or I'd love to be a really good mountaineer. I'm like a really oh, yeah. bad mountaineer, and I'm all right at running. <laughs> so I would, like, <laughs> That's a good shout. That's a good uh, shout. I'd like to do that too. I could choose anything. God, like I would have loved to be able to like to be a better horse rider and or yeah, oh, really? learn more with the kid. Yeah, or an ice skater. Keep... Yeah, imagine all the things you could do if you didn't ride bikes. <laughs> There's a lot of time left in the day, isn't there? <laughs> there is. I'm going to start your quick fire off with the same question. What would you do if you didn't ride bikes? Uh, sailing and like big ocean sailing. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. What, what did you want to be when you grew up? What did you want to be when you grew up when you were young? Um, stinking rich. <laughs> really? Yeah, that's all I live for. <laughs> that's why you're an endurance rider, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, things change. <laughs> <laughs> did your mum have a favourite phrase that she used to say to you when you were little? Ah, uh, good one. Um... Yeah, if you can't say anything nice, then don't say anything at all. And it's from the film uh, Bambi. And, and that might set the scene on what I was like as a child. <laughs> oh, so funny. And does Isabel say that to you now? <laughs> a variation. <laughs> Do you have, or like, have you had like an epiph epiphany song or a phrase that gets you through? that just that is there it just changes your mindset I, I wouldn't say it's a phrase I love music um I, I love Dire Straits uh, and uh, any Dire Straits song from, from the album Dire Straits will just sort of take me to an incredible place 
but the thing is that I also love that. This isn't a quick fire answer, but yeah, I, I love that. I love that album though. Um, and if you listen to an album in a bad time, it can get tainted. So you've got to be careful about how you use music because you don't want to ruin your favorite song. Nah, you don't want to overplay your favorite song. But yeah, no. we're not very good at quick fire, are we? We chat. Ah, that. it's quick. Okay. My last question, and I had hoped that we'd warm up a little bit by now. Um, do you think you would have won the Transcon twice if you didn't stay in any hotels? Ah, uh, good one. Uh, I thought you were going to say, do you think you would have won the Transcon twice if Christopher had raced? <laughs> <laughs> that would have been cheeky. Um, if Christopher if Christoph had raced, then obviously no is the answer. <laughs> and um, the hotels... <laughs> Yeah, I think so, given how I've raced in Kyrgyzstan, the Highland Channel, things like that. I think I've changed as a rider since then, and I've, I've, I've sort of had to grow into that or develop that side of racing. So. Oh, what a lovely reflection. Hey. <laughs> That's really yeah. nice. Yeah. I think it might have been when it came to that talk in London that you were uh, doing. And, like, hotel, you you were just like, well, no, like, you know, get the hotel because then I'm going to get a better sleep. And, like, it all makes absolute sense. But I suppose coming from a, a more of a dirt baggy, mountain bikey, high on trail sort of background, then hotels would never have been in my, in my sort of, yeah. No. no, and I have to say, if I race TCR or a road event again now, I would take at least something for sleeping and I probably would sleep out one or two nights um, because at some point I had to push further on than I wanted a couple times to reach a hotel, which was undesirable. And that did cost me, but that was like twice in three years or something like that. So, you know, in Europe, these opportunities are available, but, yeah. and yeah, if you race the Highland Trail or Kyrgyzstan or something, there's no option, is there? You're, you're, uh, you're sleeping out. What, what's the best sort of like, not, not the best night's sleep, but what's one of the like, sleeps that you've had when you've been racing that you come back to because there must be one night you've slept you've been like this is incredible i'm so grateful to be where i am and... oh, so often eh? like yeah. sometimes I, um, I i've got a particular memory like that of a few nights in a row when i was i think it was either at the end of russia coming into mongolia when i was just like desperate i was so tired just really wanted a hotel couldn't find anything and then you know that way that you're going and you know you're really tired you're going you're going you're like can't see anywhere to sleep and you're beside a road and each night I would find like this pipe that was underneath <laughs> and I would get in it and at first it was like oh it's not a hotel but you know it's all right it's a pipe and then I'd get in it and I'd feel my bike in and by the time I would set up in my sleeping bag I'd just be like staring out at my little like poor home staring out at the at stars yeah I think it was the second night or something and uh, the third night maybe and I laid down in my in my bivy bag or my sleeping bag you don't need a bivy it's so warm and uh just looked up at the, at the sky and it was just filled with stars and there was no light pollution from anywhere because you're in the middle of nowhere and I thought and I, I I needed to go to sleep and I should have been going to sleep but I must have lain there for like 20 minutes just staring at the stars you know mm -hmm. and just taking it in and then I think eventually I passed out but <laughs> but but it was that was like okay sleeping in a hotel is great and all these things but those sort of moments are really the special ones aren't they and they're the ones that you treasure and I think that's perhaps why you know when pushed if I was asked on road off road I'd come to off road as well because you can have stuff like that in a different way I think the experience is there but yeah, yeah it's like like the Mongolia thing looking at it was just you're just in awe aren't you yeah absolutely and if you ever had I, this is the reason I love the bivy bag instead of the tent as well is that like when you wake up so you know like you don't always sleep amazing you know some nights you sleep, <laughs> And, uh, but when you wake up and then you've just got the sky and the stars yeah. and the moon above yeah. you, there's just no better feeling, is there? No, nothing. Wow. I mean, if I yeah. can, like, if I, if I don't need, I, I rarely take a bivy with me anymore these days. And I, if I, I take a tent sometimes and I use it if I have to, if it's raining, but otherwise I sleep out and, and look at the stars. And this is something I spoke about in circles a bit with Jenny Tuff was that like, if you're out there having adventure, you should be out there having adventure, not in a tent, you know? Yeah. And, and why would you sleep in a tent if you could sleep outside and stare at the stars and wake up staring at the sky? It's like, it's, 
that's the experience that you're, that you're you know paying for with with your physical endeavor not not to sit in a tent and you know read your kindle which is what i used to do and i still do but yeah i love a book <laughs> take a kindle with you oh not on a race not on a race not on a race but when i was touring you know it's like, do you prefer a sunset or a sunrise? Oh, that's a tough one, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know what? I would have to go sunrise, not because I prefer the way it looks, but there's nothing better than riding through a sunset, through the night, and then riding into the sunrise. And that warmth coming back into your body as, as a new day dawns, and you've ridden through the night. Like the first time I ever did that, it was... It was like quite profound and exceptional, really. And it was it, it, like, you can't buy an experience like that. So yeah, sunrise. Where was that? Where was your first over, like through the night? Or oh, it would have been like, fully, fully through the night would have been the first ever TCR I did. No, would it, did I sleep the first? No, yeah, it would have been the first TCR I did. So riding down to Mont Ventoux. Um, so six, six, seven years ago now. <laughs> oh, wow. I had a same experience on, um, I did the Cairngorm loop and it was a, it was a like washout. I think it actually been canceled. There was so much. <laughs> right in Scotland. <laughs> no, but I just, I just uh, took off anyway. And I thought I'm never going to like finish it in the time that I need to, but I'll, um, I'll just go and see if I can ride all through the night and, you know, get into Blade Apple. And when I did it, it feels like, like I don't know something's just been opened up for you isn't it it's like oh my god I've got all this extra time that I can get somewhere now. <laughs> <laughs> <It's sweet. laughs> I don't think it's yeah. good but occasionally no but it's it's amazing isn't it like it really is amazing and it's amazing like because through the night your body will dip the circadian rhythm and you'll feel terrible and you know have no energy and nothing but the, and, and your ache and all of this, but as soon as the sun rises and that warmth goes into your body, you just get like another wind. It's not even a second wind. It's like you're, it's a whole new day and it's a whole new body almost. And you're just powered up. It's That's incredible. Do you know what? I don't get that. Do you not? I no, I actually oh. dip when the sun comes up and I've still been No. Moving. What I about do. when the rain comes out? Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's weird. I assumed everyone, everyone, I just sort of assumed that everyone was like that. When the sun came out, it, you know. It makes sense, doesn't it? But there's something about it that, that gets me down that I've not been to bed yet. No way. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I can understand that. Like, yeah, it's confusing. Yeah. But. And especially if I've still got like quite a long way to go and I'm like, oh, the sun's just come up and I've still not been to bed. <laughs> um, those hours before dawn are, are, are horrid. And so it, 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 doing a race like, I don't know, the Highland Trail is better than something like Atlas Mountain because Highland Trail, you get like four hours of darkness. Mm. Whereas Atlas was like 11 hours of darkness. Yeah. And it's like 7 a.m. and it's still dark and you're like, oh, come on. <laughs> Well, when we did Le Jog, we did a Le Jog from the, you know, um, Land's End to John O'Groats, but we did it over New Year, so three of us did it over <laughs> So it was like New Year in Scotland, like the coldest, darkest months, and we had about six hours of daylight through the day, and we were riding for like 18, 19 hours. We did it in four days, so it like self support so we just I got our heads down and we were right we must have been riding for like 12 hours in the dark every night if not more like yeah that's like <laughs> that's cut your teeth difficult that is like Christ do you remember we first met on the Highland Trail yeah 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 it was pissing it down in the morning I had no brake pads left on my bike uh we'd, we'd I'd slept in the bothy that bothy doesn't exist anymore they've not yeah, down. I remember being at the content stores with you and telling you, I was like telling you how to change your brake pads. <laughs> I probably needed that information at that point. I mean, to be fair, you did pretty well that year, but you went back this year and properly smashed it, didn't you? You have really yeah. worked like, that was tough. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Andrew still rode away from me when we were up on the Glen Glen Freakway. Like literally, just rode away from me on this mountain bike section. Like, uh, 
like an actual mountain bike and can, and then I'm just sort of trying to pedal along behind of him, like, where's this guy going? I can't keep up. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I think it's like anything, isn't it, really? You, you try something once and you're like, oh, this is, this is well, it's, it's, it's fun in a weird way that these things are fun. But you're like, oh, I suck at this, I suck at that, I didn't know about this, I didn't know about that. I can totally do like a zillion things better next time. So I'm going to have to come back and put them into practice because otherwise it's like, this is not the best of me. This is like the worst version of me. And so yeah, you come back and you see how it goes and then you're like, oh, I can still improve that, I can still improve that, I can still, you know, you get stuck in a loop of, uh, yeah, continual suffering. <laughs> I absolutely know what you mean. I was dot watching like crazy this year. Like, <laughs> like you know, I love the Highland Trail. I, I, I think I've been on it four times, done it four times, but obviously it's my local road. And, like I know every inch of it and then we yeah. know the riders that are doing it as well yeah. it, it just becomes so exciting so but I wondered when like so I was you know I was updating every five minutes checking out where you all were but I wondered what you guys were doing at the front because there was you know quite a sharp end like quite a quite a you know split in the race and yeah. at the front, I wondered like do you ever pay any attention to how anyone else is doing do you ever log on like where, where are you at with that stuff yeah it's a good question isn't it and i think it depends upon the event and the point in the event so the highland trail for example like it's a mountain bike event you're not exactly able to use your phone while you're riding along are you so if you're using your phone you're stopped and so you're wasting time it is is the first thing the, 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 then with a race like that, you're probably going as fast as you can and you probably can't really change that much anyway. And it's only four days, so you're making a full effort from the beginning. So it's not like I can suddenly see, oh, Liam is like dropping me in so far ahead because he's amazing. Let me just catch up with him, I'll put it in another gear. It's not wasting time. Uh, no, so uh, I'm already going as fast as I can, aren't I? So it's like, there's literally no point in checking the tracker because it, there's nothing I could do to change anything that is happening. So I just, no, I didn't check it at all. Um, I mean, I checked it like on the final day just to sort of see when I came through Fort Augustus down to Fort William because there's that uh, canal path that you go along for like an hour and, well, actually it's nearly three hours. It's nearly three hours. Um, and that's boring as hell. So I just checked to see roughly where everyone was then and I was like, oh, here we are. That's cool. William's about to finish. That's great. Um, but yeah, otherwise there's no point. But something like, TCR on the road, you could check your phone easily while you're cycling along, you know, cycle safety, all of that, right by the rules. But uh, with something like that, it's sort of like nine days in duration and you're definitely holding something back in that kind of race, or I am anyway. Like I don't go flat out for the first four or five days because if you want to be good in the ninth day, you can't treat yourself like that. Or I can't treat myself like that. So you can switch things around in a race like that. And you might not, like I personally probably wouldn't want to be first in the early part or even in the second, uh, third of the race because it's a lot of pressure. And then you've got people chasing you. I'd rather like be near but not too near and then sort of make a pass, which is kind of what I have managed to do. I, I have to stop myself. Naturally, I'd want to be checking, but I know that I'll have my best race if nobody else is in my head. Like if yeah. I accepted that it's just, that I am doing this for me and whatever happens to anyone else is, you know, great. And when I can get into that, I just find my flow. And then when I get caught up on, on the screen and how well I'm not doing or how well other people are doing, it's like, ah, it gets to me. Or oh, yeah. people, if people are just behind you, you're like, ah, like panic and just start like going off your plan, and, like going too hard to poker, you know, close to you. It's, it's silly. It changes things, doesn't it? Yeah. Have you ever, have you ever like called anyone like completely like out of it or anything like that? Like, I just... I've fallen asleep. Yeah, I've fallen asleep on the phone, at, like yeah. up on the phone to them. But I've also called them, and the minute they answered, said, "I have made a terrible mistake." And <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. It's like it's like drunk dialing, really, isn't it? I know. I can't do a two-way conversation. Are you? No. How are you with Isabel, your wife? Do you, yeah. do you keep in contact during races, or how do how do you? Um, do you? Like I said before the race, you're not going to hear from me, don't expect to hear from me. And that's like the rule, you know, no news is good news kind of thing. Um, 
but like, I will send her a message if I get a minute, just being like, oh, everything's all right. Like a voice message, as, as you say, it's really easy to send a voice message, isn't it? That's just like, yeah. hey, this is my situation. And like, I won't really get much back or I'll get a message back saying, thanks for letting me know, or that's cool, or like, you know, so, like that kind of thing. But like, I'll never call and like, be like, oh, hey, it's really crap. You know, can you give me an emotional pick me up? Kind of thing. Because that gets back into that, like, is it supported, unsupported kind of thing, really. Mm-hmm. And I, I have said to people like, I'm not going to call you, and if I do, don't be like giving me emotional support because it's support. You know, it's, there's not much difference between like someone firing you up on the phone and giving you a pep talk and like motor pacing you. You know. Well, I know it's so interesting, isn't it? And I was thinking that earlier, just like we're talking about the Karen's Gorm, Karen Gorm loop and how we're both really attracted to that, like get back to the grassroots side of things. Yeah, we both like make a living in different ways but we both like you know this is we've essentially commercialized the thing that we are <laughs> really and we and both want to like, do uncommercial things <laughs> but like, can we is, is like where does the self-supported aspect of it you know start yeah. like does it start you know when someone's got a full-time job and this is like their hobby like they does it start when they have to pay for absolutely all their own kit and get their own bike fixed and you know it's it's like a, an, a real sliding scale and it goes you know yeah. right up and it's like do you phone home do you meet people out there like we had the really um uh, interesting one a couple of weeks ago that you know about because I'm making documentaries with GCN just now and Global Cycling Network um, and we are we were well we were we were getting ready for the transcontinental I was going to race it and try and self-film but there would also be film crew out there following the race so following a few different riders and um, I, I thought it would be okay because I didn't think that I would I thought that they would annoy. I thought it would annoy me so much that I wouldn't get any lift from it, so it wouldn't be a support. <laughs> we, went and, we went out and did a trial run, so it was um, three days, two nights in pretty horrific weather. And every time I saw the van, I was like, oh, "Hi guys!" Like just like delighted to see them. Like not allowed to hug me, so that was like we put that sort of rules in. But like. Yeah. Half day two I was in such a mess and like one of the cameramen hugged me and the other one kept saying like do you want a Snickers do you want a Snickers <laughs> I'm like I'm self-supported but I didn't know anybody who was doing this stuff you know I didn't know anyone who was um ad- like adventuring or even cycling like there was one guy in the place that I lived that had a that had a road bike and I used to actually think he was a bit of a weirdo <laughs> <laughs> Why is he right. on that silly bike, you know? Um, right. Yeah, didn't see it. And I mean, the Highlands has changed a lot in the last, like, you know, I'm 41 now. So in the last, like, 35 years or so, it's changed a lot. And it's way more common now, people in the outdoors. But when I was growing up, it just wasn't, like, and um, so I didn't really see it. But adventure, you know, we were always out sort of having adventures. But it was only when Lachlan went to school and I went back to college that I w- went in and um, did, a, like, an introduction to outdoor pursuits, it was called. And so it was just like a really basic level um, a course that I was like, what? Like all we can do all these things <laughs> like for six months. And we learned to like mountain bike, canoe, kayak, uh, ski. We went away over to the Alps. It's like first time in the Alps. Just like, what the hell? And just, yeah, I like had no idea this life was here, was out there, like that people were doing this stuff. And it was a real changing point. Like it really changed the way that I saw the world the possibilities that I saw and just instantly got me hooked I mean you know we talk about cycling we've been talking about cycling that's what like our sort of chosen sport but actually it's the mountains and the wild places and you know just being out in that yeah in that real wild environment that I get a kick out of you know that's the thing that I love more than anything and it's the thing that I felt most at home at like when I find the mountains and when I find you know that I could go like learn to navigate oh my god like what a skill to have and I just I just felt feel at home like I instantly felt like this is what I need to be doing this is where I am like my best self for sure Mm. 
it's interesting. That's really interesting. That's really interesting. And I, I can obviously like I can obviously see where the adventure syndicate came from now because you didn't have this and you wanted to give it to, to young young women. And yeah, yeah that's well, really so, cool. So that was so the adventure syndicate was Emily Chapel and Lee Craigie's baby. So they were they came up with that, and um, and it was it was it was less it was sort it was sort of more because they both experienced. Um, that females, like female athletes, weren't getting the same opportunities as male athletes, and there wasn't like a voice for them, and not just athletes, but you know, sports people in general. And, yeah. and then when I, that Lee and I have both got a background in sort of um, like working in youth work, basically, and uh, in the Highlands as well. The two of us have worked up here, and so we were really keen when I came on board. I was really keen. That that's when we started looking at like the school's work and getting out and like you say, like introducing these young people into, into a world that, that they didn't know. But I, I'd actually been doing that before, like before I went around the world, that's, that was my job. Like I got into, I got my qualifications and I was working with young people that were really struggling in school and but just didn't have an idea about what, what else was out there. So yeah, I worked t taking groups out into, the, out into the outdoors for quite a few years. Yeah. Oh, but that's, that's, funny that you, that's funny that you brought that out, the app, because I wanted to ask you about something that I saw on your website. <laughs> So you say, you quote, when I step outside of my comfort zone, I feel lucky. Oh, yeah. And my I cliche. Wondered, <laughs> and I wondered, um, I wondered, like, where's the, what, what different, what's the difference here? Like, we see James Hayden when he's out racing, when he's the dog, when he's on social media, when he's absolutely busting himself. Is there... A massive difference to the, you know, actually James Hayden that isn't riding a bike. Like, who is that James Hayden, and what, you know, are you doing out of your comfort zone? And do you need to get the phone? No, it's the front. It's the front door. But it's probably uh, no. I'm ringing it. I don't know, it's half nine here. So that's not. That's not going. Oh, that's a tough question. That's a good question. Um. I think it's always different, isn't it? The, the the image that people see and then the reality. And you see some great images like the Photoshop person versus the legit person, you have a six day transformation and that kind of rubbish. Uh, and the reality is always different, but I think I try and not share everything, but give an honest image of like, you know, that, that times are bad sometimes and you feel like rubbish and you get ill and sick or you have injuries. And um, when times are great, because people understand that you have to work from a point of zero back to where you were. Like last year, I got injured, um, uh, like I had an injury on my sit bone, and I couldn't sit on a saddle for seven weeks. So it, from, from when I finished university, so uh, I did a degree in civil engineering and I finished that last year. And like literally the week after I finished that, I got injured. So I was like, I had all the time in the world and now I couldn't ride. For seven weeks I couldn't ride. And I worked back up from sort of zero. And I was like well off my game, but then I went and did some races and, and they were really good fun. But it was kind of, that was, that was interesting because I was like, I was not in good shape. It was not me really racing. I was like someone else because I was so out of shape. But yeah, I still went and, and did that. Um, so yeah, I guess I try and show like a full image of, of life, but definitely not like everything because... You're allowed to keep some things private. Um, and then I kind of am a private person as well. And I don't really I don't really have opinions on what other people's opinions are of me. So I'm just doing my own thing. And if you like that, that's great. And I try and be me and honest about who I am and how I feel. And if you that's not for you, that's totally cool. But like that's me and, and be myself. And everyone should be themselves. Um, but you know, I could live under a rock probably quite quite happily. <laughs> <laughs> Are you quite an introvert? Yeah, 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 hundred percent, hundred percent. I extremely. Why? So. And I guess but people don't know, people don't understand. I mean, like you met me for the first time when I was doing that public speaking thing. Yeah. I think in person, and that person is like, I can do that, and I have that because I've 
been to kind of school and learned these things that you need to act that way. But like, that's not the reality, I guess. Yeah. But it's not fake because that, that's real, but it's like, it's a real confidence and it's a real like assuredness, but it's not like, yeah, it's, it's yeah, maybe. I know what you sense. mean. I yeah. totally know what you mean. It's like you you have a, you can still be real, like you can still be your real self, but have it, like do what you need to in public. But actually your comfort zone is like way, way far, far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think the comfort zone thing though, as well as like, I'm always interested in challenging myself. Like I'd rather go and do a race, like say the Highland Trail or something else. I've got no skills in, probably going to suck at come wherever because who cares about where you come then go and race a race that i know i'm gonna win because I, I just don't really care about that like i'd rather i'd rather not win every day of the week and have amazing experiences learn new things and just get punished and be so far outside what's comfortable and just do something that's almost routine um this is interesting this is really interesting to me because um i wondered if you you know like you're a you're a name in endurance cycling like people know yeah. expect you to to place well they like you know they know that you're a skillful rider so do you feel the pressure of that when you're going when you get to start yeah. that? Do you deal with that? It's, it's a good question like no I don't feel external pressure. Yes, I do feel internal. And a good way to summarize that is actually at the Highland Trail, I was chatting with uh, Liam uh, and, and his partner, Eleanor, at uh, just did a campsite where we were staying before the start. We were just you know, talking, talking some rubbish about this and that. And um, someone else uh, came over and asked me, oh, I can't, uh, Mike Sheldrake actually. Yeah, it must, you know, my shadow with the beard. He's, he's done Highland Trail twice now. He came over and yeah. said, uh, "So James, how are you feeling? Tell me the truth. Don't, 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 don't tell me the rubbish." And I said, "You know what, Mike? I've been training for seven months full time. If I didn't say I was feeling good, uh, I'd be a complete liar. Uh, I'm in the best shape I've ever been. Really, nearly the best shape I've ever been in my life. Um, I had an injury in February, but it, it didn't really affect too much. But I was, I was in very, very good shape. And I said, you know." there's no one else in the world really at this race who's had that opportunity like if i don't win this is going to be embarrassing for me you know i'm, I'm so pleased with third place like i don't even actually care about third place i'm so pleased to finish i got third place it's kind of inconsequential to me i'm pleased to finish and there's so much positive that i can take away from that event and the way things went the way the training went all of this i'm like i'm just really pleased with how that process and that event went so that's cool. Yeah. Okay, great. I, I, if it were like sixth or tenth, I wouldn't have cared if I'd had the same race I did have. Yeah. Because that race went really well for me. But also to come back to kind of your, your unsupported question, and I'm off track, but it's, it's quite interesting, I think. Um, so Liam has a full-time job working at Airbus. And, and I, I spoke to him about how much he rides. And he does ride a bit. Let's not get that wrong. And he trains hard, you know, but not the amount I can train with the time that I have available. Um, Andrew has two kids, full-time job, and probably barely trains. Like, let's be honest, if you've got two kids and a full-time job, there's not much time left to do to do anything. So probably rides the bike a little bit. And so for both of them to come out and place ahead of me in the event, you know, Liam by a significant amount, Andrew by an hour, is really cool for not just the race but the sport and everything because it says to these people like this guy is like me, talking about me like i don't know you know pretty good i'm, I'm not going to be myself up pretty good has all the time and like so much opportunity and yet these guys come out and kick his ass like that's cool i like that you know as a fan i like that and i think that's interesting yeah because it's like we all love we all love that story if the, it's these boys are not underdogs by a like <laughs> no no they're absolutely skillful athletes but i um, but there is that there is that element of that like when people have got full-time jobs and you know and and fitting it in like it fitting it in it is it's you know i've got pals i've got pals like that that i've got the opportunity to ride way more than they do and then they come out for their one ride a week and absolutely kick my ass <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, and, like, yeah. and then 
they go back to like being my my pal Dave's the worst for it. He goes back and he's like a dentist, but, so it's not even like you know a chilled out job, and he's just a baby. And you're like, oh, all yeah. right, nice. And just like overachieving all over the place, Dave. <laughs> but that's yeah, what can you do? James, that's really cool that you can like that you've that you can have that view like the, and it sounds like you honestly do it's, it doesn't yeah. sound like it's not a slightest jenny i wouldn't yeah, yeah yeah i mean i do know how good liam is and i know andrew's a very good mountain biker but yeah they, they are incredible not to take yeah. away from their achievements but to, like yeah it's really cool yeah amazing what have you taken from that then like to 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 go on to next year when you go and smash it I'd say not just for well, I might not be next year, but when when I do next go, yeah, third time's a charm. But I think it's just be the best you can be as a person in, in whatever you're doing and, and always try and keep improving. And you're gonna make mistakes and things are gonna go wrong and like just just keep keep going. <laughs> is that all? Is that all we've got to do? Just always be the best person we can be. <laughs> You got to try to always be the best. Yeah, you can't always be the best. Even I'm not. I'm, I'm yeah. terrible at the time. But uh, just try. It's the try. It's the try bit. That, that word try is the really important one. Like the other one's not so important. But just try. As long as you try, it doesn't matter the result. But if you've tried, then it's fine. Yeah, for sure. For you, it, well, what, what, what's your takeaway from 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 all this like long distance, you know stuff? I think it really, I think it, you know, you hear about it all the time. I think there's so much pressure, particularly on young people because of social media and comparing ourselves to other people. So that like comparison, that journey of comparison is just like, it can just be so destructive to to you as a person and even what you want to achieve you know and like what you want to do you can just be so influenced and I think long distance riding um or these particularly these sorts of races shows me that because that thing that you can never underestimate the person who's riding behind you or in front of you or like beside you you know like you could write someone else like write someone off because you met them at the shop and they look absolutely wrecked and then a couple of hours later they're like riding on by you and you're like oh man like you've got you know so much about you so it's that thing of like not underestimating other people but equally like not comparing themselves to you you're just out there having your here's your go at it you know here's your go at this route and it's the sort of same for life isn't it it's like this is your goal like you don't need to be worried about you know who's still back at the shop and who's just leapfrogged you because yeah it's just a journey and when I get that right that is when I'm my happiest 